The New Jerusalem, a biblical prophecy, and the sacred mission of an ancient order of knights. You can look, you can listen, you must keep silent. Could this reveal the true purpose of the Freemasons? Adrian Gilbert, writer and astronomer, has spent years studying various prophecies about the end of the world. Many Christians believe this will be marked by the second coming, and this will be heralded by the construction of a great city, a new Jerusalem. And there is a particular passage in the Bible that intrigues him. When I look in the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, it says here, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. So there's a puzzle in this quote. It's not saying Jerusalem, it's saying New Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem in Israel. It must be some other place. And I wonder where that place is and what this New Jerusalem is all about. With the destruction of Biblical Jerusalem and its holy temple almost 2,000 years ago, many Christians have looked for the New Jerusalem, a city which will be home to the lost tribes of Israel, where Christ will return, marking the end of the world. Gilbert wants to explore the origins of the New Jerusalem prophecy. To help, he's enlisted the aid of freelance journalist Sophie Morris. But first, to find the prophesied New Jerusalem, Gilbert investigates the history of the lost tribes of Israel. He has come to the British Museum to meet Michael Clarke, who was president of an organization founded in the 20th century, the British-Israel World Federation. Clark and his organization have a special interest in the prophecy, a story he traces back to the 8th century BC, when the Assyrians conquered the kingdom of Israel. Clark wants to show Adrian a 2,700-year-old carving that depicts the beginning of the scattering of the tribes of Israel. The mural shows how the kingdom of Assyria waged war on their neighbors. All of this portrays this kind of uh, war that was going on in the 8th century BC, a very big conflict of history. The Assyrians conquered the lands of the Israelites and took many of them into captivity. What we have here is a very powerful depiction of this whole enslavement of the Hebrew race. The majority, four-fifths, were actually deported um, en masse over several decades uh, into Assyria. What happened to them? Well, I mean, this is the, uh, the big mystery of history in the Hebrew race to all intents and purposes, disappear. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel disappear from the biblical record. These were the so-called lost tribes. Where they fled to in their exile is a matter of great concern to Clark and others because, according to the prophecy, they need to be gathered at the new Jerusalem. Clark and his organization believe they know the answer, but it is controversial. When the Assyrian Empire collapsed, they just moved out. This is several million people. Several million? Yes. So, I mean, this is not just a small affair. So where do they end up? What happens to them after that? They're moving ever westward over the centuries to these isles of the sea. So the descendants of these lost tribes are living in Britain? That's... In effect, in effect, what has happened? Goodness. The society to which Clark belongs is nearly a century old, 
and claims important connections. Among its past members, it boasts a Prime Minister of New Zealand and figures in the British establishment, such as high church dignitaries and even members of the aristocracy. We see that we have Elizabeth II here. Well, that's our Queen, yeah. Our Queen, and going back through James I. Right. Through the Scottish kings. And all the way back through to King David of Israel. In the royal house of David. So what you're saying, basically, is that the line of David is actually sitting now on the throne of England. That is the plain evidence that we have before us here. Wow. Whether the lost tribes of Israel fled to Britain will remain a matter of controversial speculation. According to the biblical prophecies of Ezekiel, all 12 tribes will come together and the Holy Temple will be rebuilt as a place for God to live. The first temple, called Solomon's Temple, had been built in Jerusalem using sacred geometry. It was then destroyed 400 years later. Some think that knowledge of the temple and the secrets of its construction may have been jealously guarded by the Knights Templar. Some believe that they may have even been brought to London. Adrian has come to Temple Church to meet author Robert Lomas. He has been called the real-life Robert Langdon from the Da Vinci Code. He is also a Freemason and has researched the history of the Masons and legends of the Knights Templar. They were originally founded back in 1126 by Hugh de Payen and he took nine knights out to Jerusalem to defend the pilgrims. They were rewarded for this by being created as an order of knighthood and they were given the right to camp on the site of King Solomon's temple. Which is why they were called Templars. That's why they were called the Knights Templar. The poor soldiers of the Temple of Solomon was their full name. Many believe the Knights had a secret agenda to search the Temple of Solomon. They didn't do a lot of guarding in the early days. They seemed to uh, spend their time digging. So they may be doing a little bit of archaeology? Possibly. Uh, treasure hunting is what I would call it. What would they be looking for? They would have been looking for that great secret which had been lost after the time of Solomon, which was the Ark of the Covenant. The Knights Templar held the site of Solomon's temple until 1187, when they were driven out and fled the Holy Land. This is where the founding myth of another secretive brotherhood starts. They were reputed to have sailed to Scotland. They sought sanctuary with King Robert the Bruce, they assisted him in his battles against the English, and out of gratitude to them, he founded the Order of Freemasonry to house them. Ah, so they, they become Freemasons. Many place the origins of Freemasonry with medieval stonemason guilds. However, legend has it that the Knights Templar carried the mysteries of the Temple of Solomon to Scotland seven centuries ago and passed this wisdom to the secretive Freemasons. So let me get this right, the kings of Scotland were directly involved in founding Freemasonry. That's what the founding myth says. At the beginning of the 17th century, King James VI of Scotland would become King James I of England. The British Israel World Federation believes that he was a descendant of the biblical David, King of the Israelites. King James was made a Mason in 1601. So would he have known their secrets then? He would have been taught the, the legends and myths of Freemasonry. And he could have brought them back here to London? I think he definitely did bring them here to London. The legends suggest that King James, along with his fellow Masons, became custodians of the secret knowledge of the Knights Templar. The aim of the Masons is to rebuild the uncompleted temple. That's the aim of the Masons. The Templars had been the guardians of the most important building in the world, the Temple of Solomon, and the whole story of Freemasonry is based on the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon. So they might have wanted to do it somewhere else, and that somewhere else could even have been here in England. If you listen to the words of, of William Blake, 
They did refound Jerusalem here. William Blake, 18th century poet and intellectual, wrote one of England's greatest hymns. It's sung so often, and yet few people stop and think about the deeper meaning of the words. It might be that Blake, like many people in his time, believed that the new Jerusalem was going to be built right here, in England. Adrian believes Blake was hinting at an earlier time when Jerusalem was built in England's green and pleasant land and he wants to look for clues to where exactly it may be. Meanwhile, journalist Sophie Morris is following up the lead on the Freemasons and their fascination with Solomon's temple. She set up a meeting at their headquarters, the Grand Lodge. In the lodge, Freemason and historian John Hamill explains the symbolism showing Freemasonry's important connection with Solomon's temple. This is the grand temple. You've got echoes of Solomon's temple. You've got Solomon himself, Hiram, king of Tyre. Between them, the two great pillars, the Ark of the Covenant and um, the Ten Commandments and symbols representing faith, hope, and charity leading up to a Hebrew symbol for God. In the middle, you've got a, a pentacle, of five point of star. Again, a reference back to Solomon. It was also known as the Seal of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And above that, um, you've got the all-seeing eye of God, which reminds us that whatever we're doing, God is always watching us. So it could be that King James VI was the first royal mason someone who Gilbert thinks united both the secrets of the Masons and the bloodline of the biblical King David. That he brought these beliefs to London, where he was crowned in 1603. But did he see London as a potential site for the new Jerusalem? If so, how could it be built with the old city in its way? In 1666, four decades after the death of James I, an opportunity reared its head. In the early hours of a Sunday morning in September, fire broke out in a bakery in Pudding Lane. Within four days, the devouring flames had largely destroyed London. It was destruction on a biblical scale. Many believed it the wrath of God. The Great Fire of London is commemorated by a single column known as the Monument. Here, Adrian meets Oxford professor Alan Chapman. Well, here is where the Great Fire started. In right. early September 1666, it raged for three days, blown by an east wind right into the heart of the city over there. Over 400 acres were destroyed. <laughs> Ze vliegen zonder GPS. Ze landen op water, ijs of sneeuw. You don't know if you're 50 feet or 500 feet above the surface. En weten nooit wat de dag gaat brengen. Dat is een interesting flight. You never learn unless you're out of your comfort zone. Het echte leven van piloot. Back at the Grand Lodge, journalist Sophie Morris wants to know if Ren was a Mason. This is the first, the 1723 edition of the Constitutions of Masons, the, the rule book. What is now seen as a largely legendary history of Freemasonry. Anderson, who compiled the history, he accuses Christopher Wren of having been the Grand Master who neglected his duties. So Wren could have been a Mason? There's a small amount of circumstantial evidence, 
there's a note in the manuscript of John Aubrey's diary, um, which he says that there was a meeting in London in the 1670s when Wren was made Grand Master. That's the only record of it. There's no other mention of it. If the legends are true, and Wren was indeed a Grand Master, he would have been privy to the Mason's secrets, including, Adrian believes, those from the Knights Templar. Even if Wren had never seen Jerusalem, is it possible he saw himself as an heir to the architects of Solomon's Temple? Um, it could well be. Um, he certainly did a lot of study when he became interested in, in architecture. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that he would, he would have gone to all sorts of sources like that, all sorts of, in their terms, historical sources, mm -hmm. while he was formulating his ideas after the fire of London. Fate, then, had perhaps presented Wren with the perfect opportunity to build his new Jerusalem. At its heart is a single magnificent temple, vast and majestic, it is not hard to find. St. Paul's Cathedral. This is amazing. This is really Wren's masterwork. Gilbert looks for anything that might link Solomon's temple and Wren's great cathedral. The Book of Kings includes the measurements, considered sacred, of the original Temple of Solomon. And it says in the Bible, in the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. He paces the building. This is the south side of St. Paul's, and there's the great pediment there with a phoenix on it. And of course, the phoenix symbolizes the rebirth of London and the rebirth of St. Paul's itself. Having measured the cathedral, Adrian checks it against the biblical account. That's 11 units there, 11 units there, and 33 long. So this square bit here is a third of the length, which is the same measures we have with Solomon's temple, one third, three thirds. He's clearly adopted the proportions of Solomon's temple because he wants us to see this as being a successor building. Gilbert thinks the measurements of the cathedral reveal something else about Wren's design. The height of that cross from the ground level down here is 365 feet. Yet from the level of the floor of the church, which is up some steps, it's only 355. So 365 is days in the year. But 355 is days in the lunar year. 12 cycles of the moon. So he's kind of saying that the cross unites these two cycles, the sun and the moon. Gilbert believes his research shows that Wren's great church didn't just mimic the Temple of Solomon, it was also, in effect, a giant timepiece. Clearly there's calendrical significance in this church, and there's the sense of time cycles, the lunar and solar calendars like clocks, ticking away the days, the hours, the minutes. So he's embedding into this building the secrets of time and measure. But why does Wren need a giant clock? Is it counting down to something? Because he's a Christian, he's expecting the imminent appearance of a Messiah figure, perhaps, the resurrection, the judgment day. For Gilbert, the biblical messages encoded in Wren's St. Paul's are clear. The idea that those lost tribes had regathered here, reformed, and once more renewed their oath to God, prepare the way for the second coming. Whatever the final destination of the so-called lost tribes of Israel, Gilbert is sure that Wren and his contemporaries believed they were on a sacred mission.
that St. Paul's was the new Temple of Solomon and London the new Jerusalem. The place where the second coming would happen and start the final judgment and the end of the world. <laughs>